ask about the senses. Let me ask about, about the sense ancestry and when they came to the United States and where you come from. My parents came from the Russian-Polish border, uh, now Russia. Uh, they came to America. My father, it was very romantic. My father and mother got married very young. He came to America worked for a year to save up enough money for passage and sent it back to my mother. And then she came to America. And uh, this is early 1900s. And I was born as my brothers and sisters. I had two brothers and two sisters. Uh, we were all born in America. And uh, they were the story of the usual immigrant family in America, the parents wanting to send everyone to schools and things like that to get a better education. And uh, my parents were very liberal in their outlook and all, and wanted us to be what we wanted to be, and gave us total freedom in, uh, in education and looking ahead, and uh, were wonderful. I realized how, as I got older and smarter, how good they were in uh, shaping us. and. Uh, and as far as uh, relationship with other humans and people and, and all their uh, other people just that they dealt with uh, throughout their lives. And uh, I'm very proud of them. And now for quite a while, they, my father lived about 86, almost 87. My mother lived six months after him because uh, and she died, nothing, no illness, but uh, she had lost her, uh, the only one that she could share, and that she had shared her life with. Uh, and I'm sure that is the reason. Uh, and uh, they had a happy 60 some odd years of marriage. And uh, you were brought up on the East Coast? Probably. In New Jersey, about uh, uh, 
and then I went in the army and uh, stationed on a ship, an army transport, and uh, sailed all over the world, North Africa, and invasions there, and then Sicily, and then uh, North Atlantic run, and then we went to the <coughs> South Pacific, and uh, were there for the last year and a half of the war. And then I'd been to San Francisco once or twice during that period, and uh, I thought I wanted to live there <coughs> after the war. And uh, then after the war, I went to school there. First, I went to school at Rutgers and took a it's a, one of the oldest universities in America. I have a degree in poultry husbandry, <laughs> which helped me in my fun career. And so someone said, how? I said, well, dealing with chicken shit. Uh, and uh, I took a short course, because at sea or, and in the Army, you have all this time off. You think, what do you want to do? And I thought, oh, it wouldn't be great to have a farm. After completing the course and working on a farm, I knew that wasn't for me, and then moved out to the West Coast, uh, uh, to San Francisco, where I went to work for a record distributor, which was pure luck, because uh, it was something I liked, uh, music uh, at that time, uh, still do, of course, and uh, stayed with it for all these years with the music. It is all these years, isn't it? Because one of the best known things about you is that you actually moved into the film business or into a film, to being a film producer really rather late in life. <coughs> yes, well, we had, been, we'd had been successful in the record business and uh, uh, with Creedence Clearwater Revival and uh, uh, I started, started to feel I was an overnight success after 21 years. <laughs> Uh, in the record business, uh, and uh, the uh, I started to feel I was recycling myself, and having been a real movie fan from the time I think I was four, I wasn't five yet. Uh, the first picture I remember was the original Lon Chaney uh, Phantom of the Opera, and I went with my brother, who's two years older than me. My parents took us to the theater and left us off and then picked us up after the theater. But they took us there to see it. We went to see it and uh, I remember we were so frightened we ended up sitting on the same chair holding <laughs> each other and we were talking about it. We loved it and uh, I think that hooked me on films uh, um, and oh, we went to see everything. We went to see everything. We knew every actor. We knew character actors, and uh, uh, at one time the character actors were very important in films. They played the same kind of part in all the films, and nobody treated them disparagingly uh, at all, because that's who they were, and uh, you expected to see them. They were like members of your family, or uh, storied family, and uh, you wanted to see them again and again. And, it's like seeing a great comedian. You want uh, Charlie Chaplin to be Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton to be Buster Keaton. Uh, uh, even today, 60, 70, 80 years later, they're still great uh, because they had, that was them that they were projecting. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, I was complaining to my partner, one of my partners, bitterly about I'm getting tired of the record business. Some normal bitching and uh, he said uh, well what do you want to do and in my innocence and ignorance I said I think we can make movies and uh, we I had no background at all except paying money to go in to see a movie uh, um, and uh, we did a lot of homework and uh, he asked what did I do I want to make and I told him there are two pictures two books that I love that they can make great pictures one was uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, and the other one was uh, at play in the fields of the Lord. And, uh, I was so naive, I thought you just could make a picture of any book, even though we had uh, knew about contracts and recordings and rights and things like that, and then found out that uh, people owned them. At that time, the 
you bought rights companies in perpetuity, so they owned them forever, the movie rights. And Kirk Douglas owned Cuckoo's Nest, and MGM owned the rights to At Play. So we couldn't get them because Kirk Douglas wanted a star in it and choose the director. Uh, and uh, our attitude at the time, which later I found out was uh, uh, quite perceptive, uh, but we came to it out of like out of that innocence, <coughs> was that he was too big a star, that people uh, to be McMurphy, that people looking up at the screen would see Kirk Douglas, not McMurphy, and that always bothered me in pictures like that, that in dramatic pictures <laughs> I didn't want to see. I wanted to be drawn into it, and uh, so he didn't want to sell it to us then, and. Uh, uh, we went ahead and made a picture called uh, Payday. It was about something we knew little about. It was about a second-rate country and western singer with Rip Torn. And it's a good picture. It's a very good picture. The only weaknesses we see later is, uh, excuse me, is secondary casting, not the primary three or four people, but the secondary uh, casting, which we accepted someone else's... Uh, uh, choosing a people, a casting person, and found out later, from then on, we very seldom made that kind of mistake, that uh, everyone you cast, you have to think about, even if they're one line or two lines, or no lines and are important in a scene. Uh, uh, and it was a good picture, did no business at all, none at all, except the critics, uh, major critics in America, <laughs> loved it, as well as minor critics. It was a tough <laughs> picture, but we knew it was a, a, a truthful picture of what went on in the music business, and, uh, and it worked for us, and it worked for the critics, and, but, uh, no, but it gave us enough courage to go on, because uh, it was recognized that, uh, uh, as a good film, and Cuckoo's Nest was the next film. And, uh, of course, at the time it came out, which is not known, uh, to, to a lot of people, it was the seventh, that's number seven, the seventh largest grossing picture of all time, which is amazing uh, when you think it was an independent people made by people who really uh, didn't have any background in films. And Jack uh, Nicholson had never been in a hit picture. He'd made some wonderful pictures up to then, but none of they were all minor uh, grossing pictures, they would probably did as much business as an independent, a smaller independent can do today. But he, and people in a business knew him, the public really wasn't aware of him. They knew, they'd seen the picture, but they didn't know who he was. And he is a, a great actor, Nicholson, really a great actor. And then we just went on, kept making picture after picture, and we were lucky enough uh, not to have to make pictures, in the sense that we didn't need a picture a year to exist. So therefore we could choose. Uh, sometimes we chose wrong, but we could choose, and that enabled us to make some of the other pictures we made by waiting and working on the scripts, which are still the most important thing to a picture. Um, Someone once said, I don't know who it was, that the, the, uh, the script is like a platform for a trapeze <coughs> artist. And you need that platform, but the director is the trapeze artist. And he's right. Uh, it is. Uh, without the script, the director can't make a good picture. I don't, no one, no one fixes it on the set. You may change some things and make some things a little better, but you can't fix something. You can't make a picture work out of a script that doesn't work, no matter who the actors are or who the director is. Can I, can I um, move in here and ask a, um, a couple of questions then about uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? Um, <clears throat> so it was um, it's a, it's an independent movie. It was Why Can't the Nurse Die and Jack Live? Uh, 
than a happy ending kind of story. Not realizing, not even caring that it wasn't the picture we wanted to make. They don't care about that. They are looking for it with an eye on a box office and, and uh, thinking they know something about it. And uh, we said no and uh, didn't do it. And finally, we made the picture. We decided we will make it without a studio. And that was done out of uh, uh, independence, really. Uh, uh, we knew what we were doing. And we borrowed the money personally. We had to sign notes for it, uh, the bank. And the uh, films without a contract for 13 or 14 years, without a contract for the next film, each film had a contract. Uh, but they n never tried. We always kept final cut. We were smart enough to learn that quickly because uh, that's the whole answer to independence is if you can control the, uh, the end of the picture that no one can touch it. Uh, you listen to everyone if they have a good idea. You you change it, you'd have to be stupid not to. You listen to ideas from everyone. But you don't make changes unless you think it makes your picture better and not to please someone. So did United Artists... Uh, we saw dailies for two days and we made a deal that made us happy and them happy. They were very good. They remembered uh, Hollywood has a notorious reputation in business and it's earned. They earned it. It's not bestowed upon them. Uh, uh, they remember phone calls and you know, any conversations where normally you even have trouble with written contracts in Hollywood. Uh, what you have to remember about Hollywood, the studio, it's a business. It's a new <coughs> business to them. They love making pictures because the glamour is associated with it. But uh, most of the studios, almost all of them, are small parts of big corporations and they have to make a profit a little more than last year every year and they want their money back quickly so they're, they're not thinking at all uh, about the picture itself they're thinking about the picture only in the sense that how um, can this make money for us and uh, they want stars because they still have uh, stars please their bosses and uh, uh, makes them look better on their program that they have because they're making 20 some pictures a year usually 20 to 25 uh, um, and their program is usually laid out for a year and a half or two years and they can talk to the money men at the company and show them that i have redford coming in i have so and so coming in and, uh, Meryl Streep's making a picture. And they people, they recognize the names, their bosses. Uh, and uh, uh, that makes everything a little easier for them at the studios. Okay, let's, we might come back to the, the, uh, the, the money or the business side of it. But um, let's, let's pick up on, on, your, on your relation, your working relationship with Milos Forman here, who directed One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest and then later on went uh, to uh, uh, also directed Amadeus. Um, tell me how you met him and, uh, and, and tell us about him. Both him. Michael and I, uh, Michael Douglas had the rights from his father and uh, part of the deal was that he had to be co-producer, but he was an employee and could be fired. But it was great, working with him was great then and we're better friends 23 years later than we even were at that time. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, both he and I, Michael's a movie fan, could be a film fan, could be a great producer if he just produced films. Uh, he's got courage and integrity and is a good person. Uh, uh, we decided that uh, we wanted to make the picture a certain way that the picture that Cook was in 1873, he said, uh, well, we told him about talking about reality, and he says, "Well, he said almost all symbolism and allegory comes out of reality. If you can look at it, it's exactly right. It does. And if we made the right picture, everyone would be able to relate to it, see some symbolism that affected them, 
or an allegory that affected them, because we all see different things. Uh, and uh, of course that was as true then as it's always been, and it is true. Uh, and then we went ahead and we've had a happy relationship and we're <coughs> always looking for things that we can do together. But the thing is that when you work with a director, it's the same thing with Mingala, that you're looking, you both, you establish a friendship and a relationship, but you both know that you have to passionately want to do something together. That you both, if one wants it, it's not going to be enough and you'll ruin a, a friendship because you have three and a half to sometimes five years of a relationship you're spending many hours with them as you've ever spent with anyone or spending like a lifetime with them. Was uh, that the, was that, sorry to interrupt him, was that actually the case with the movies that he made between uh, One Flew Cuckoo's Nest and Amadeus, there was hair, wasn't there, and there was ragtime, which might have been movies that were your kind of film, I'd have thought. In certain no, ways. no, I, I love hair. I think every time I watch it now, it gets better and better and uh, great filmmaking. Uh, as is. well, and uh, no, I didn't have any, and they were brought by other people who had rights to it and produced it. Ragtime was owned by Dino De Laurentiis, he produced it. Uh, um, no, I would have loved to make both of those, but you couldn't, uh, you know, the different people had the rights to it. Uh, uh, and uh, let's see, uh, that happens all the time. Uh, there's a couple of things we, that I liked that he was kind of lukewarm or, uh, about and didn't want to do, and he had something that I didn't, wasn't crazy about uh, doing. Uh, you know, uh, you both have to be honest enough where you can say no, and it doesn't affect your relationship, uh, uh, which is I think true friendship is gets to that where you can say no to your friend about something that he likes, or even films that say you don't like a film that they love, you know, uh, or vice versa. Well, well, let's let's come back to Amadeus uh, in a moment because we, because obviously that's a very important um, uh, landmark. But uh, in the meantime, you went off and, and made a film with this guy Ralph Bakshi. Uh, the flame going. Uh, I heard that you uh, persuaded the Archbishop to allow allow you to use his palace, and so on. So tell us a bit about this. Well, and there are all sorts of machinations going on with the, the it was a very rigid communist government with uh, agents on the picture. I, I was followed by about, for about three or four months, and Milos was followed 24 hours a day in his garden that someone would be sitting and they'd let you know about it because they instill a kind of paranoia in you. And the guy who was watching me there, and I, I had my dog, I had a basset hound, and I uh, brought it to the location, the Milos had his dog, uh, Labrador. And uh, uh, I'd take the dog out and this guy would be, as might be cast in a picture, had a leather jacket, a cap, and smoked his cigarette this way. Uh, and uh, my dog recognized him that same guy. I would go up and wag her tail, and I'd say good morning to him. He'd say good morning, and, uh, and every day. And uh, went to work, he'd get in the car and follow me out to the studio. Then he'd left me at the end of the day. I would see him again, and uh, he worked a 12-hour day, I know. Uh, uh, and then uh, finally, after about three months, uh, we came out and he was there and the dog uh, uh, came over to him, Gina came over to him, wagging her tail and petted her, he petted her and he put his hand out he said, goodbye, no more. And that was the last thing. I figured I was okay and I was in CIA because that was a big problem they had. They wouldn't let us into certain buildings that really were nothing because on another level we found out we had good friends being had very good friends there, that whether we were there to make a picture or to spy on them, you know, like anyone would want to spend nine or ten months and 
Czechoslovakia at that time without having to spend it there, you know. That, so, uh, but did you have to spend? I mean, it must have been a it, it must have been a, a, a big decision then to use Prague and not one of standpoint. Prague is my Vienna, which was his city. Uh, although Prague was loved him more than Vienna did. Uh, uh, in Vienna, the first floor, street level of every street are boutiques and uh, it's like a big shopping mall. You know, in town with cameras, you have to be very careful. Prague, the street lamps were the same. All you had to do was take off the bulbs and put little oil dishes in them to make lights and you could 360 on many, many streets uh, and everything was fine. Uh, even television antenna which were there, weren't as prevalent in other cities as they are in other cities and other capitals. We went to Budapest and uh, we could have shot in Hungary, but the language is a terrible barrier there because in Czechoslovakia we had Milos, and we had uh, Andracek, the cameraman, and who spoke Czech, which was, and people that they had worked with. But it ended up being made on a, a financial basis that we could make it there, even though Budapest was a little cheaper. The language thing was, uh, we knew the problems daily trying to communicate with them uh, and uh, would be tip difficult. So, and Prague, uh, we had castles, we had, uh, uh, someone had warned me everything should be in writing. And we had a lot of things in writing that allowed us to go certain places uh, and, and use certain places. and which were 18th century places that were still looked exactly the same as they did then. So saved a lot of work in uh, creating something. Uh, even though a lot of things were done on the set, uh, we had the benefit of, of locations. You know, I, saw, I saw the film re recently, of course, for this interview, and uh, it's visually it's, it's really stunning, I think. Uh, magnificent stylizations in the costumes and stuff. I was, I was interested about the, uh, as I was watching, thinking about the, the casting in this movie, because quite often um, movies which are, as it were, set in the past or, or have aristocratic subject matters use English <coughs> actors, but you use two actors here, F. Murray Abraham and Tom Hulse, one of whom uh, is rather English, I suppose, in a certain way, but uh, Tom Hulse definitely not. What was the, what was the thinking about well, um, casting there? Murray Abraham, we'd seen on uh, Cuckoo's Nest and when we were casting, and uh, uh, we didn't cast him, even though he was known to us, because we didn't want too many New York-looking guys on it, with Danny uh, DeVito and Vinny Scavelli. It looked like could be New Yorkers. We didn't want three guys who could be New Yorkers out of the nine, nothing to take your mind away from what you're seeing in that circle in Cougar's Nest, the balance of every man, America, different parts of America, what we wanted to do. <coughs> Milos uh, uh, didn't remember him, and I didn't, I told him. We have a thing we do that uh, we give each actor 15 minutes, because a lot of guys that act or walk in say, gee, you're not quite right, even if they're not quite right physically. Uh, we talked to them for a while anyway because it's so difficult for them to come in and be rejected, you know, anyway. Uh, and, uh, I told Milos that, that we had seen him and he came in, Milos is wonderful, he said, Marty, Marty, it's so long, I haven't seen you, you know. And uh, that, for Murray Abraham, is the best thing you could do is recognize him. Uh, and uh, he loosened up and uh, we were talking to him and as he left, we'd seen quite a few actors, name actors. Milo said, that's Salieri. He said, he's the kind of guy who's Salieri off stage as well as on stage. And he was exactly <laughs> right. He, uh, he knew him, you could tell, and I asked him why he thought that. He says, well, he's had smallpox, and uh, he's marked a little bit on his faces. And he's the kind of actorish ego, which is not an act I better have, uh, that knows he would be the greatest star in the world if he didn't have 
smallpox, the face. You know. And he's a very good actor. Milos made him a great actor, though, in the film. Of course, he's much better than Tom Hulse. Really. No, I, I like, I think Tom Hulse gives a better performance, really. I think uh, the fact he's made up, people credit that to acting, appearing old and young, and it's a great makeup uh, um, that could fool us, you know, seeing him walk. And I think Tom Hulse's performance is a greater performance, really. Anyway, you stayed with Czechoslovakian um, themes, or Czech themes, for Meet Him and what? what, what I knew him in that? San Francisco. Uh, he lived in San Francisco, and I knew him for quite a few years. Uh, he's, I mean, he's a very good director. He's rather, we've lost sight of him a bit. I mean, I well, he's, he's a uh, good director, but he's not in the class of other, of Milos or, or Anthony, I don't believe. They have another intensity towards what the the, pro, the film they're making that he doesn't have. Because uh, there's cool directors too, who are some who are great and are mm. cool, you know. Uh, this raises an interesting question. I mean, the same script f filmed by different directors, of course, makes a completely different film. Exactly. I mean, w w were there other candidates for for the unbearable light of being? Who 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 else? Would well, you I thought of? he was the right. Guy, uh, so I chose him, but he had such a good cast and such a good script. And uh, Jean Claude Carrier wrote the script, uh, literally ninety some odd percent of the script. Even though Phil's name is uh, the co-writer, uh, Jean Claude wrote the script, uh, and uh, the, to everything about that was there. Uh, anyone can direct a picture if you can count to ten. But that doesn't make you a director. Hmm. There's something else you have to